As nuclear power-related technologies promise to make interplanetary trips faster, more efficient, and more affordable, there has been much discussion about converting the SpaceX Starship to use nuclear propulsion. It would allow for a great increase in specific impulse and a massive extension of mission capabilities. But is it actually worthwhile at this moment? Discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. But before we begin, our team extends a warm welcome. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to stay up to date with the latest news from SpaceX and the world of space. With that in mind, let's jump straight into today's episode. Well, first and foremost, we must recognize that nuclear thermal rockets have impressive performance, especially suitable for colonizing Mars. While most rocket engines rely on a mix of fuel and oxidizers such as liquid hydrogen and oxygen, nuclear thermal propulsion, NTP systems offer an alternative that is twice as efficient and powerful as traditional chemical rocket engines. NTP systems utilize nuclear reactions to generate the necessary heat, converting liquid propellant into gas to produce thrust. This enhanced efficiency has the potential to reduce travel time to Mars by up to 25% mitigating challenges such as cosmic radiation, microgravity, and astronaut boredom. NTP engines also offer increased mission flexibility, especially in the context of Mars expeditions, as they require significantly less fuel and a minimal amount of uranium. Their potency allows missions to occur even when Earth and Mars aren't ideally aligned for launch, providing a more accessible and frequent window for human travel to these distant worlds. Nuclear propulsion addresses the significant fuel requirements for deep space travel, enabling larger payloads and more frequent missions. To grasp the magnitude of this challenge, consider that launching the International Space Station required more than 30 launches over a decade, costing a substantial amount. The future of space exploration could be transformed by SpaceX's Starship, a towering 120-meter rocket that fundamentally alters how space missions are conducted. Its potential to launch three times a day and refuel within an hour holds the promise of making space travel routine and cost-effective. With anticipated cargo launch costs as low as $10 per kilogram, space missions could carry larger payloads, advanced sensors, and more affordable rovers to explore Mars collectively. However, NTP can reduce the price to about $2 per kilogram. For these reasons, they are lauded as the best way to accelerate human exploration and expansion into space. More importantly, a nuclear-powered starship would not be a complete overhaul of the design. It can still be a 50M tall steel tube that launches atop the super-heavy booster using vacuum-optimized engines fed by large propellant tanks and a set of smaller gimbaled engines optimized for landing, with flaps to handle re-entry. Dry mass in the final version will be 120 tons and about 30 tons of propellant is reserved for landing. However, it might be unsurprising to you that we cannot simply bolt on nuclear rockets to the Starship and expect everything to work. Special modifications have to be made to accommodate the new propulsion system, ranging from new attachment points to control software, but we will focus on the most impactful one, radiation shielding. The shape of the Starship is not well adapted to handling the radiation from a nuclear rocket. There are large flaps extending to the sides that could scatter radiation back into the crew compartment at the top. Retracting them when the nuclear rockets are in use would be a good idea. Designs that were meant to be nuclear from the start also usually place their reactor or nuclear rocket far from the main body of the spaceship on the end of a long boom or tapered propellant tanks. Radiation released from a fission reaction spreads as a sphere in all directions. If it is placed further away, the main body of the spaceship intercepts a smaller fraction of it. The fraction of radiation that cannot be avoided is handled using radiation shielding with different layers meant to absorb different types of radiation. It is placed as close as possible to the reactors or engines to create the widest shadow of protection, which is why they are also called shadow shields. It must be noted that some radiation protection is already built in. The beryllium or graphite reflector within the nuclear reactor prevents some radiation from leaving. The 30 tons or more of landing propellant, especially methane, is effective at absorbing neutrons too and will always be present while in space. A much larger load of propellant will be drained as the nuclear propulsion is used, representing several meters of shielding. Furthermore, 
there will be a 25-meter separation between the engines and the crew compartment, so only 1 slash 625 of the radiation is actually intercepted. Finally, there would be significant changes to be made to supply propellant to nuclear rocket engines. We would extend them to take up the volume currently occupied by liquid oxygen. We won't be changing the total volume of propellant tanks available to us, for a fair comparison with other versions of the Starship. If we selected liquid hydrogen, we would need specially designed tanks with insulation and active cooling. If we feed the nuclear rockets with liquid methane, we can use the same type of propellant tanks as exists today. The propellant tanks dedicated to landing would also have to be changed. A nuclear starship is expected to have a heavier dry mass, so more propellant is needed to land it, which means larger tanks. With some changes, we calculated that the nuclear starship can load up to 165 tons of payload instead of 100 tons while performing the same trips. The chemical starship could potentially load up with 465 tons of payload and slow boat it to Mars on a minimum energy trajectory. This nuclear starship can do the same with 495 tons of payload, limited mostly by the huge landing propellant reserves it needs. Or it could reduce its payload capacity to aim for even more delta ebb and even faster trips. With reduced payload, it could widen the Mars launch window by several months and often be able to go to Mars and return with refueling on the surface before the two planets move too far apart. So, will going nuclear be worth it? Sadly, the answer is no. The biggest challenge is on reusability. Discharging the payload to orbit and then re-entering means the nuclear engines are still hot after landing. Even if the landing itself is performed with chemical Raptor engines rather than with active nuclear engines, the residual radioactivity means that any ground crew would need to be fully protected. The refueling facilities will all have to be shielded and adding a new payload then stacking it back on top of a super heavy booster without contaminating them become very difficult tasks. Even in space where we don't mind irradiating the empty environment, there are issues. Approaching the International Space Station becomes impossible unless the starship cools down for a month in orbit. Docking maneuvers between a starship and the craft meant to refuel it have to be done along a narrow corridor between each ship's radiation shadows. Moon landings take place about three days after departure from orbit and the use of the main engines. Nuclear rockets would still be hot by then and dangerous to any astronaut approaching from the surface. They would have to land far away from any lunar bases and rely on shielded rovers to transfer payload across the moon's surface at a safe distance. The lack of any air to grant free radiation shielding means this safe distance will be very large. So, it is possible to envision a nuclear starship in the far future. And that just wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high quality content. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you next time.